тем, кто присоединяется, мы потихонечку ждем. Кто из каких штатов? Можно спросить? Миссисипи. Флорида. Да. Северная Кор... Очень Северная Каролина. Да. Элеонора, здравствуйте. Это Кори Андерсон. О, 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 здравствуйте, здравствуйте. Как здорово вас видеть. Фанта, фантастика, да. Это моя первая русская преподавательница. А теперь мы коллеги. Пенсильвания. Очень трогательно. Should we? Да, я думаю, что можно начинать. Да? Um, we're not recording this. We are. We are. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are recording. And we are live on YouTube. So. Okay, well, the рабочий язык, the working language of, of the conversations is English, so we, we're going to switch to English. That is not to say that Russian is not allowed. Uh, if you feel more comfortable asking questions or commenting in Russian, that's that's fine too, but We are going to use English as the working language um, of the conversations. And um, I would like to first introduce Natalia Ushakova, president of the American Council of Teachers of Russian, um, who will uh, say a short introduction uh, to this event, and then we will proceed. Thank you. Uh, dear ACTR members, uh, much is changing in our profession due to the global health crisis. And we have to rethink, readjust, and uh, reinvent how we teach the Russian language and uh, culture. And to engage our field in a discussion of this and other related topics, American Council of Teachers of Russian has organized <coughs> five national conversations on the teaching of Russian. I would like to thank Evgeny Dingup and Irina Dubinina for initiating and organizing the ECTR conversations. On behalf of American Council of Teachers of Russian, I would like to welcome you to the first conversation, changes to the pedagogy at the post-secondary level uh, with a focus on programmatic goals, uh, methods, classroom-based assessment. Uh, thank you to our presenters. And now I turn the conversation to them. Thank you. So um, as uh, Natalia already said, this is our first conversation. And before I introduce uh, everybody and, and show the kind of broad questions that we set for today, can I ask everybody to turn off your microphones um, for now um, while our invited panelists are speaking, it just will be easier uh, in case if there is any background noise. If you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat as our, um, uh, as our panelists are speaking. So the way, the way we structured this event, really it's, 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 a, it's not really a formal event, it's really more of a collegial conversation. Uh, thanks to technology, we can do it across different time zones and different geographic locations. Um, we do, uh, but, but to have some kind of structure, what we propose we will do is that we first ask our panelists to share their thoughts, ideas, comments, their thinking forward uh, towards the fall based on several questions that we came up with. Um, and then we will open it up to comments and questions from everybody. Uh, here and then you can turn on your mic when you want to speak live. If you would rather leave a comment or a question in the chat, you can do that too. We'll be monitoring the chat and we will be asking. Also, while our panelists are speaking, we will be monitoring that chat too. So if some questions come up that are better asked now when our panelists are speaking, 
um, I will keep an eye on that as well. So you can see on the screen our panelists, and I want to join um, our president, our ACTR president, president in thanking uh, our colleagues for agreeing to be um, members of this uh, panel. Um, most of the names or all of the names are probably well known to you. So it's Linda Benedet, Brown University, it's William Comer, Portland State University, Cindy Martin, University of Maryland, College Park, um, Shannon Spasova, Michigan State University. And I actually don't see Shannon, but she's, she said she will join us just a little bit late. She's running from a different Zoom meeting. And Kristen Welsh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, who is the opposite of Shannon. She will have to leave a little bit earlier. So we're all, we're all juggling. Oh, I see Shannon. Yay, Shannon is here. We're juggling different um, commitments. And so I um, am from Brandeis University, and that's where the Zoom uh, link comes from. These, these are the broad questions that uh, we thought would be of, um, that we think are in the minds of every, all, all, all of us. Um, and we also recognize that this division into post-secondary and secondary education is rather artific artificial in many cases. And in many cases, we face similar challenges. We understand that we're dissecting a very complex, large organism that is our profession into smaller pieces. And inevitably, we're losing some uh, something in dissecting it this way, but um, for the ease of this of these discussions, uh, we thought we would start with a post-secondary level. There will be a separate discussion of secondary um, uh, teaching Russian at the secondary level, and then other conversations are connecting actually both post-secondary and secondary. So for example, the next one, next Friday, inclusivity in the Russian language uh, classroom certainly uh, unites uh, all levels of instruction. So for today's conversation, our first conversation, we will look at, we will hear from our um, experts on the panel and we will hear from you, all of the participants um, on these questions. So what should learning outcomes be? in the new changed environment in which we will be teaching, whether it's online or some idea of hybrid. Um, how should we approach assessing students? So how do we show to students and to ourselves that they reach the goals that we set for them? This probably is um, a more pressing question for the beginning uh, level of instruction. Um, I don't know, I may be speaking for myself only, but I suspect that many of you will share with me the concern for the first level that is greater than a concern for the third or the fourth year of language study. And then the large question of what should we do in the classroom to achieve this goal? What specific things we need to do in the classroom? So um, we're studying, um, I will stop sharing. This is just to show you what broad questions we have in mind. I will stop sharing now so that we have the screen with all the faces there. Um, and so with regard to the first question, I'm going to ask Cindy to start, uh, if you don't mind, Cindy. And then um, panelists, please add comment as you feel is necessary, and I will try to keep us on time moving through this conversation. Okay. Well, I would offer just on the first question about what should the outcomes be, uh, that you have to figure out where the course is that you're going to be teaching in the fall in the entire curriculum. So that's always the question, right? Um, we're not actually moving to an online program, like an online curriculum, right? That would be a very different conversation. If we were saying, we're gonna be delivering the next four years of instruction, our undergraduate major is going totally online. That would be a very different kind of curriculum revision. This is saying, we're in this extraordinary situation. We have this one semester, maybe a little bit more, but, but we're not, rethinking the whole curriculum for an online delivery um, forever. Uh, and so I think a lot of the lessons that we'll learn from doing online for a semester or two will then be easily incorporated into some making some of our face-to-face uh, -face classes more efficient, in fact. But that would be my first question is, where does the course that you're teaching 
fit into what's coming next. So if it is a first year course, it's gonna look very different than if you have a fourth year or an advanced course or a conversation course or a readings course or a writing course or whatever it is. So I think that's the, that would be the starting point for me is to say, how can you think about the, what you can maximize in the, using this online environment in this short time frame? that will then feed into the next semester. And then how will that next semester look different? So maybe we prioritize different modes, maybe we do different things in the fall semester, planning at the same time what's gonna happen in the, in the spring semester. So I'll stop with that just as a starting point to think about uh, how to set outcomes. Uh, they're not going to be exactly the same as they would be if we were in our traditional, traditional modes. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, and Cindy, just a quick uh, qu um, request from from the participants. When when you talk, this seems like your computer is shaking. Uh, my yeah, okay. I got to get it on a table. There we go. Okay, that should be better. Thank you. Okay. Um, but panelists, if you have something to add at this point, or I can ask the question, Cindy, because I know you talked about the different modes. Uh, mm -hmm of communication that we should be paying attention to when we think about setting uh, learning outcomes for this semester. Right. So if I, if I were still thinking of, of wanting to prioritize speaking in a first semester course, let's say, then I would use the online environment to have students rehearsing a lot more than they get to do and recording themselves and being ready to fly with more spontaneous interactions in the spring but I would have them using the opportunity to use the recording mechanisms uh, in Zoom or whatever other platform you're using, a uh, learning management platform that you're gonna be using and have them almost doing pre-speaking exercises and activities that would get them ready to really engage in a much more robust, spontaneous way in the spring semester. If I were thinking of doing, uh, if I were gonna focus still on speaking in a first year course. Okay, thank you. I know Bill was holding a uh, hand, unless I misinterpreted. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to pop in and uh, follow up what Cindy was saying. I, I think, yes, you really need to look at your whole curriculum and the course outcomes for each part of that curriculum and thinking about where you are. Um, I think uh, moving to online, um, at Cortland State, we work on a quarter system. So when most folks on semester systems and last spring, um, it was just the second half of your spring semester that got uh, moved to the online platform or remote um, for Portland State, it was all of spring term, right? So um, I and my other colleagues and mostly my other colleagues um, had a lot more experience. And what we learned from that spring term was um, you can, come up with basically similar outcomes to where you wanted to be. Um, it does take a little longer in the online uh, remote environment to get activities set up. Um, it does require a little more pre-planning to get um, things where you need to distribute materials to different groups of students so that they can have some kind of information gap activity in the kind of breakout rooms and Zoom so that um, the outcomes weren't super affected, but certainly the, um, it was a little slowed down in terms of how much one could share with students. And if it slowed down, then ultimately, yes, cumulatively, you may wind up at a slightly lower place or a different place than if you were doing everything kind of face-to-face -face and had some of those um, situations where you could add on more material because you were in a classroom, right? And you could just suddenly take advantage of a spontaneous moment. Um, so uh, I also have to say that I, I feel a little bit like a fake and a fraud talking about moving uh, to online instruction for next year, because I actually put in for a sabbatical for all of next year. And so um, these are really thoughts that I'm having that I'm sharing with colleagues and not ones that I'm going to have to experience on my own skin. Smart um, move. Lucky you like that. Um, thank you. Um, I would agree with Bill that, uh, that 
tweaking the way that you do activities is something that the online switch, if you're teaching any part of your course online, even if it's a hybrid and you have some classroom time, that it's the figuring out how I can accomplish the same thing in different ways. That um, is one question. The question that I felt affected my outcomes just in terms of what results are there at the end of the semester most was the fact that the semester was a week shorter. Right. A lot of universities did away with their spring breaks or they extended their spring breaks and Brown will ex will actually keep the shortening. If you ever want to call it that in the fall as well. So we're going to I'm going to lose a week in the fall and that more than anything else is affecting what I know can be the outcomes in all of my courses. Right. Less time. You can't you can't rush acquisition. It happens at the speed it happens. You you can't suddenly squash 14 weeks of material into 13 and magically hope it's going to be the same. Would you still expect students, let's say it's the first semester to be you would still expect them to be somewhere moving their way towards um, novice high, they're not going to be there, they're novice mid by the end of the first semester. We just still, still expect them to be there, even with one week short. Well, I would expect them to be where they would be at one week shorter. I think that's, I can't change that fact of the calendar. It means, I, I mean, fortunately, I'm the language program director. I have oversight over the whole of the program, which means that I can look at the program articulation and see what it is that has to be adjusted. And yes, I will make those adjustments. And um, that's like the virus. It's something that I cannot change. Well, I also wanted to jump in and, and add to that. Um, remember in spring, when suddenly we had to move to remote, you mostly were in classes where students already knew each other. Exactly. Right? And for that first year Russian class um, in the fall, you're going to have to build in some kind of introduction and create some kind of group feeling mm -hmm. that's probably going to have to happen in English um, before. So there's another thing that you're going to have to add to your teaching schedule, mm -hmm. right? That's going to take some time away from where you might have come out if you have the exact same amount of time. So that community building that's going to need to happen early on so that they can feel that sense of trust when they're trying to do things that are really hard, like pronounce boo, um, uh, you know, seems more natural to them. So, so thinking about that is also going to shape a little bit about your, your outcomes. There is a question, uh, Lynn, probably directed at you. What actual adjustments are you considering? I would love to hear specifics if possible. Um, well, as Bill said, I'm definitely building an orientation module. I'm building it in pre-start of semester so that there's a set of things they can access it and they're going to be strongly encouraged to complete that during the, you know, arrival on campus time. I think students have to arrive and isolate themselves for a few days anyway. Um, and there'll be people doing the course online, but they'll have access to the course ahead of time. And so they'll work their way through the orientation module, which has an icebreaker in it, um, getting to know each other. We, the teachers, are going to make videos about ourselves and what we do, and I'll, I think I'm going to subtitle those. And, um, and then also uh, there'll be a, a chance for the students to meet each other in some kind of um, discussion format or video discussion format, short videos. Um, and Shannon is probably a better place than I am to talk about the technology of that. But that will happen. And then normally, fortunately, in first year, we normally cover four years of four, four lessons of our book. And uh, then we usually have time to do a little something extra. The little something extra is just going to go out the window. Um, and so we'll, the first year will probably be OK. Um, it's the intensive course in the spring slash summer that will lose a lot of time. Um, the, the first year and second year, I think it will actually be okay. Um, I have a comment about that, some specific uh, 
adjustments actually. So I've taught a couple of online courses in the summer for our summer sessions for a while now, not first year. Um, but I actually, one of the major advantages of this format is you can have students more engaged more of the time of the instructional hour working individually and preparing to then come into the group and they're highly accountable for it if you have them recording themselves or writing something in that real time and that actually has become a way of making more efficient progress than having 15 students sitting in front of you where they're hiding behind other students they're not engaging fully in the in the pairing you actually have a greater accountability when they are all logged in and paying attention if the activities like, all right, I'm gonna pair you up to do this, but first you're going to record what you're gonna say first. So you're gonna think through it first and be all ready to go into that pair and you're gonna do that for your independent homework the night before. So I think that's a big adjustment is actually thinking about individualized instruction in the way that we always say we wanna do, but quite frankly, is very hard to do in a classroom in real time. But this mode allows, this online mode allows for that, especially once you get beyond the first year. There's a yeah. lot of individualized, intensive, holding the feet to the fire, many more hours of actual time on task that they engage in if you design the activities the, the right way. So. so so what I hear what I hear you saying, um, all of you, is that um, our proficiency goals are not necessarily changing. We're still trying to reach those proficiency goals, but then the material that we will be able to cover while we're working towards this proficiency goals is going to be adjusted for sure because it's a shorter semester or quarter maybe, maybe, maybe. because it takes longer mm -hmm. to get students to do that. So most likely we're going to be adjusting that. So can I can I get us back to the conversation about so from from outcomes we move to so how do we how do we know that how do we know that they are where they need to be, the students? And and a lot, I know from previous conversations that we had at ACTR with my colleagues, we all, we're all all worried about how we're going to be doing testing. So we're not going to be doing, we're not going to be OPIing the, the heck out of our students every single time they take a unit test, right? That's not what OPI is for. So they will have to do some kind of unit test. They will have to do quizzes. Um, or not, uh, what should be the format? And everybody's worried about if they are online, how do we make sure um, that we enforce uh, high academic standards and we ensure that there is academic integrity? Mm -hmm. Bill? Can I jump in? I was thinking about this in, in kind of preparing remarks. And I think um, just as Cindy was saying about a lot more individualized work, I think the assessment work is also going to be a lot more individualized, right? So that idea that I go to the photocopier, I make the four page test that has a little reading section, a listening comprehension section, grammar and writing, and I give that out in class. If you want to take that model and try to transfer it to the online world, I think you're just dooming yourself to failure and spending a lot of time about uh, your school's academic misconduct policy, because I think it is just an invitation for that. So I, I really think uh, probably the much wiser way of going is thinking about a much more atomized uh, measurement and assessment work, right? So instead of having that final exam that's worth 20% of a course grade, Right, put that more into homework where there's that regular accountability and preparing for class and capturing their performance more times over over the course of your term or semester, so that it's it's lower stakes, but you build a much better cumulative effect out of all of those lower stakes um, activities. Right. Um, and that's possible for speaking, it's possible for writing. Um, I think uh, for listening and reading, right? Well, maybe that is one of those places where you can take that small part of your, what would be a unit test and put that into your learning management system and they do that as a separate thing, right? So, so I think atomizing the assignments a lot more 
and then being sure to adjust the rubrics for these, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're getting recordings from 20 students of 10 minutes each, you're not gonna listen to all 200 minutes of that, right? And you would be insane if you did. You wanna make sure that your rubric says that you have the right to select a chunk of that and grade them on the minute chunk or two minute chunk that you'll select, right? Um, so there. do you want me to respond to this comment from Lee and also a little bit about that? So if, you're, if your university has a good learning management system, then you are, and you have your assignments uploaded and submitted on that system, you are creating a portfolio of student work throughout the whole semester, and you will clearly be able to see progress. So that's one thing. You're not, you're not having to accumulate their recordings and files, et cetera. It's all gonna be right there for you. So that's one thing that I would say. Um, and if you design the activity so that they have to do them somewhat spontaneously and that quote unquote cheating is not really possible, then I don't worry about the cheating part. But Lee, a very specific example, and I discovered this a number of years ago when we switched to a good learning management system that allowed us to record in face-to-face -face classes. And ever since then, students record for us all the time. So if we're in first year, here's a very simple example. You wanna practice numbers? you want to practice giving people telephone numbers and getting telephone numbers, don't think about it tonight, how you're going to exchange the most important phone numbers in your life. Record yourself saying the phone number 20 times. And then when you hit the, you know, the synchronous moment, you're ready to do it. You don't take time having that awkwardness of having to say it for the first time out loud and feeling very awkward about it. Do I listen to all of those? Of course not. Do they know that I don't listen to all of those? Of course not. But it's important that they're doing it, not that I'm listening to it. So that's just a really simple example. And in terms of presentation, students no longer, whether I'm face-to-face -face or, or online, they no longer do a presentation without having submitted oral drafts, a number of them, in fact. Because what I realized, especially beyond the first semester, you don't want the bad models being given to the rest of the students. So it's really important as you move up that any kind of presentation is cleaned up just like we would do ourselves. So there's no more coming to class and spontaneously delivering the you know, error laden presentation. After all, it's presentational mode. So just having them record as much as they write or type or whatever they're doing. Think about balancing it at least 50-50. If you want them speaking a lot, they have to speak a lot. Have them recording their quote unquote speaking homework or independent learning. Mm -hmm. So for those who's watching us on uh, stream, I don't think they can read the comments. So this was in response to a question about specific uh, specific um, uh, examples of activities that hold students' feet to the fire. Um, and I know uh, going back to what Bill was saying about itemizing, itemizing assessment and accounting uh, certain activities of normal coursework as higher than before. Um, Kristen, I think maybe that you, I would ask you to comment a little bit here about your ideas for frequent low stake assessments. Yeah, so, um, and, and I guess I should also admit to being a little bit of a faker here too, uh, because I had one language student this past spring in an independent study. So a lot of what I'm gonna be suggesting comes from both my experience this past spring in my non-language courses and also the work that I've been doing on flipped and bended, blended rather learning since about 2013. Um, so in terms of low stakes assessments, certainly using the learning management system to have frequent quizzes, um, which can take a lot of instructor time at the beginning to put them together, to incorporate feedback, which is just you know so incredibly important, either maladietz or no, actually this is wrong because here's what happened. Um, so, so, so I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that this is something we can do overnight, but it certainly is worth it to be able to gauge even more deeply who's doing the work, how are they doing, and where are the problems? Where are the things that maybe I need to go back and spend more time on or maybe clarify via another digital lecture? Um, so that's, that's one of the ways that I'm um, thinking about assessment. I also noticed in the chat um, that I think Daria Kiryanov said um, talking more about sort of oral assessments and I'm trying to do that as well. 
um, to, to keep engaging with my students. But the big question actually, and, and uh, Irina, I hope this isn't going to take us too far astray, but the big question I'm thinking about in terms of assessment right now is whether all of our assessments need to be graded. And I'm not talking about just sort of listening to a chunk of a 10 minute audio recording, but in my non-language courses, I've been moving toward um, the idea of throwing out grades or having students essentially self-grade because I do have to submit a grade to the registrar at the end of the semester. And in my language courses, especially at introductory and intermediate, that doesn't seem to be an easy match to make. But what I'm going to be doing this fall in intermediate Russian is taking one segment of the course grade, either 15 or 20 percent, and saying to the students, all right, you're going to work with me to set goals, to learn material that you determine. And I'm going to be basing that on what their interests are already. So, all right, you're passionate about chess. You're a musician. You love hockey. Um, and, and have it be sort of a multi-stage, semester-long learning experience where the students set their goals, write them down in English, meet with me to talk through them and to refine them, and have the opportunity to revise those goals as the semester continues. Um, what I've found in the courses where I've done the entire course this way is significantly increased student engagement and motivation. And I think those are two of the things that so many of us struggled with in the shift to remote learning. And, and so I think even though there's some risk, and again, instructor time investment is significant, um, the payoff has been, for me, transformative. And, and so that is, again, sort of the question where, where I'll stop for right now. Um, does everything have to be graded by us? Uh, Shannon, or Lynn, sorry. Uh, if Sh Shannon, can you Shannon, uh, maybe Shannon, first and then, Shannon first and then Lynn. Great. Yeah, so I just wanted to agree with my colleagues that um, high stakes, closed book kinds of tests are going to be very difficult to do in the online um, atmosphere. And I think that um, what Bill describes and what Kristen, what everyone is describing, um, where we change our way of assessing is probably the best case scenario. Um, but it does take a lot of instructor investment, it can, to rethink how we're doing those assessments. And so I just wanted to share one bit of good news about if you make a few small adjustments to your assessments, it um, they can be still workable in the online um, format. And what, I, what I'm basing this on is um, a few colleagues from MSU in the 2015 foreign language annals, they did a study where they took paper and pencil, more traditional type of tests. They tried lowering the stakes moving them online, putting a timer on it, and not assuming that students were not saying that it was closed book. And when they compared the results, they were there was no significant difference. So some of those small adjustments, um, I, like I say, I think the ideal scenario would be to rethink how we're doing assessment completely. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have the time to do that, there are a few small things we can do that can help a timer and lowering the stakes are the biggest ones. Thank you. Those are, the, those are I think, the key ideas. Lynn, you wanted to continue? Um, I would first agree totally with everything everyone has said about lower stakes, more frequent evaluations. And I'm thinking this year that instead of the big unit test, we use Mirstonami. At the end of unit one, there's a unit test. At the end of unit two, and those are 12 to 16 hour units. But instead of that, I think I'm going to do weekly, weekly Canvas quizzes. Um, but m mostly I'm going to try to have more performance assessments so that students, instead of writing a discrete point grammar test, which I agree with you, simply begs the question of, is the student going to go look it up? Um, instead of that, have students recording videos of themselves performing actual um, language tasks. Um, I went down that road this semester. I actually have two examples, one for third year and one 
her first year of how I adjusted what students were being asked to do and how they were being asked to show their work. Um, can I share my screen, Irina? Is that gonna work or not? Okay, let me try to do it. And there was a question, what textbook you use and you just announced it, Nezhdu Nami. Nezhdu Nami in first year, yeah. Um, what about second year? Uh, second year, we finish, we do the last two units of Nezhdu Nami and then we do a little bit of Puti and then we do um, Dien Bizvranya and watch Peter FM and also um, in, a, in a world with lots of time, Asenia Marafon. Um, so we started to sort of push away from the textbook by the end and so there's a certain amount of teacher materials. Okay, let me see. Can everyone see a Chrome screen that says Russian 600 2020? Yes. Okay. So this is a course when they're watching uh, My Piristroika, and they've worked on all of these characters who are interviewed by Boris Lyuba, Ruslan, Olga, and Andrei. And I was at my wit's end because normally we have an in-class final exam. And I put some of the things from the final into other kinds of uh, tasks they had to do. They had, they had oral presentations that they recorded and that they, were, they submitted drafts for in, in advance. But I needed them to do an essay I wanted it to be open book because I have done open book take homes in this course before, but I also wanted to get them to think about what words they were using and why they were using them. So I tried to be very specific in the instructions. They had to write about one of the interviewees. I gave them the audience, a heritage speaker of Russian who has not seen the film and knows very little about Soviet life. So they had a sense of who they were writing for. They had a set of prompts. A biography человека. Не забудьте рассказать о контексте его биографии. So we actually did some readings on что такое перестройка, что такое застой. They had to incorporate that information. The rubric graded them on it. Какие у этого человека самые интересные для вас мнения? So they had the, and then they had a set of language terms that I was going to be paying close attention to. Not just, but you know, which cultural or historical phenomena would your character talk about that your reader may not know. And then these language issues were very important to me. And then there was scoring, explaining about what an excellent essay would do. That's question one. The way that I kept them from using the dictionary to go mad with it was I had question two. Question two says that any glosses for vocabulary you looked up for your first essay have to be glossed here. You must bold face or color them in the original essay in number one, and then you must do this. Ulebatsa ulebnutsa kamu to smile. And and it says quite quite clearly why I'm doing it. This is to keep you from using a um uh it, it says in the question it's to keep you from using Google Translate or something like that willy nilly to write your essay for you. And they were really good about doing this. The students in the second year course had to write a similar essay about Dien Bis Vranya. And I forgot that I needed to put this type of question in there for them. And we had a whole bunch of academic code issues. But this, the third year students absolutely hewed to what I asked them to do. Because they had a way to look up words, they were allowed, I might have, I might in retrospect have given them 10 instead of five, but they, they did it as I requested. And then the student who was excellent, she was really excellent. The student who had the greatest number of problems was the student who did, he did that thing that people sometimes do in their English language essays, where the essay consists of quotes from the book you're supposed to be writing about, but there's no ideas stringing them together. Well, he kind of wrote the same way he would have written an essay in English. But I knew that he was using the vocabulary that he was supposed to be using. Um, the other example, and I can pause here, or I can just show the other example of how to move a classroom activity in a, a way that gets you. Um, Please do. Okay, so on a first year class, um, they had an info gap activity from the book. It's three David Zadanyas Shrest A. And they have an info gap activity where they're working on who plays what sports. They have to put a team together. And I gave them an abraziets for what sort of questions they needed to ask each other. And then I also gave separate assignments to each student doing the activity so that um, 
everyone who was playing an American, who had the info about the American students got this assignment, and everyone who was playing one of the Russian students got that assignment. So they had to do an info activity, info gap activity, and they had information. Normally I would have passed those out on cards during class. They made their own Zoom meetings. They had to do it on a Tuesday. They didn't have to do it at any set time. They loved this. I did it to set up some way of dealing with the time zone problem that many of them had because the class was at nine in the morning on Tuesdays. They found, gave them what they were missing, a chance to talk to their friends. And I've opened the videos not to watch them all the way through. I watched a little bit of each one. They talked for an hour in Russian doing the activities. Now, the fact that they were able to do that had to do with the fact that their textbook, which I'm about to just bring up quickly, it's very detailed. The task is laid out in a lot of detail so that when I'm asking them to do this activity, I know that they have the scaffolding they need, they have the abrasi written down, plus I recorded them, and they have all the infrastructure in place to allow them to work in synchronous pairs outside of class time to complete it. And then they just submitted it and it went into their daily participation score. It wasn't a high stakes grade at all. Um, and I'll stop here. So I, I anticipate a question, was, was there a grade assigned to this or was this credit, no credit? If you did it, you got it, your- it, it was part of the daily participation score. So they were graded exactly as they would be for coming to class and participating actively. So no, it was not a high stakes grade at all. And I think that was yet another reason why the students appreciated it. Um, and they were happy. I, I thought they were gonna find this onerous and I was amazed at the, I had a conversation with them at the end of the semester and then I read the evaluations and they're like, we really liked Asynchronous Tuesday. Um, and that was true and I did it in second year as well, um, where there was, and regular track first year. And they all thought it, it was fabulous. That, that assignment was from intensive first year where we were, you know, we, it was, it, that was maybe March 31st when they did that activity. So you actually moved us with this example to, um, you know, trying to keep a little structure here to actually discussing the approaches that we can use in the classroom, kind of big strategies, um, maybe with some specific examples. Um, one of the thing, one of the th points that already came up in our conversation is that there are some things that we can actually do better if we teach online slash in some kind of blended environment that we did in the classroom, so Cindy said individualization, uh, individualization, for example, where this kind of activity, uh, where they would be more engaged in doing a task than they would be if they were in class. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's just continue along this and and um, maybe come back to um, Cindy. Maybe come back to you. Let's just think about what we can do in the classroom to achieve the goals, to get them at different levels, to speak as much as they can, engage with the material as much as they can. What do we gain? What do we lose? Um, what happens to proficiency orientation of our classrooms in an online slash blended classroom? Is it, there was a question like, is it possible to wear masks and sit far away from everybody and still do proficiency orientation? So let's hear your thoughts. You want, did you want to, did you say you wanted to hear my thoughts on some of that? We'll well, the idea of, of motivating students and getting them to engage in what I would call our strategies of good language learners, not just the language itself, because you're, you're wanting, especially at the beginning, this is true at all levels, you want to encourage them not just to learn Russian, but to learn to be good learners, right? And so when you do things like find topics that they're particularly interested in and have individualized work on topics, either in small groups or individually, um, where they're working to learn to, to engage with the Russian language in an area that interests them in their real life, not just what's coming out of our textbook or in, in our um, classroom. I think that's one of the uh, really transformative things that can happen. Um, and actually there's less work for you when you set it up. They're all doing their individual things. You're providing feedback, but you're not quote unquote teaching. You're setting them up to engage with the language. So this works at all levels, I think. Um, I know our first and, and second year have 
uh, students working on different projects as well. Um, and I think that uh, the question about whether you can perhaps be more engaged online than face-to-face -face if you have to be in a mask and six feet apart from each other, <laughs> I think is a good one. I think actually you could be more engaged online doing what we're doing right now. I, even if you could imagine even all of us just in one big place, it may not be the same level of sort of engagement, right? Um, so that, that's what I would say about that. I think um, in terms of assessment, I would also uh, encourage us to reward behaviors, the risk taking and the behaviors. And that's what you do when you send them out to do individualized kinds of things. It's not about getting the right answer from the material in chapter five, or even being, a, being able to you know, produce a little performance video. It's actually also getting rewarded in addition to all of that, because we don't want to lose sight of that. But in addition to all of that, it's rewarding them being interested and engaged in the language that goes outside of the classroom. That usually we start to push students out of the nest way too late. Usually in second year, the end of second year, third year, where they're, we're sort of saying, okay, you have to start really swimming and stop you know, treading water and, and battling here. Um, I think it can start now, especially uh, in the online environment. Of course, you can't just send them out there and say, oh, you're interested in this, you're interested in that. Here, go find some sources on the internet. Well, that's overwhelming. They're not gonna be able to do that. So that's where the upfront work has to come in first. Like, let's figure out what are you interested in? And okay, let me give you a few ideas and how are you gonna approach this? So I think um, letting go of thinking that you are simply going to map your current course that we do and we have sort of well-oiled and just kind of map that onto an online environment or into these into these learning management systems is probably the wrong approach. I don't know if that helps to answer some of the questions, but I think you really have to rethink, how are you gonna spend the time? How many hours do they have? How many contact hours do they have? How are you gonna spend the time? How much of it will they be reading? How much of it will they be listening to you? How much of it will they be uh, writing? I mean, the online environment, um, we've been doing, I've been doing this for a while now. There's absolutely Russian, early level Russian students need grammatical explanations, at least the analytical learners do. To pretend that they don't is also a, a false sort of approach, right? You can't tell me to teach to the whole class and then tell me I have a variety of learners in my classroom, but do it this way and never do explicit instructions. Some learners need explicit instructions. They need them in English. They don't need them in the classroom though. They can get them online in a recorded mini lecture. And once you have it, yes, the upfront investment is huge, but once you have it, you import it into the next course and the next course and the next course. And even when you go face to face, you no longer have to give up your classroom space for a whole lot of things that we can now record and have ready for them to, to listen to as many times as they want. So just rethink how to use the space um, and how to, how to develop what you're gonna be developing that can then be used in face-to-face -face environments. And that's what Shannon and Kristen has been doing uh, for a while. Kristen, you, I see your hand. I just wanted to comment. Um, there is a, a, um, a very, for, especially for those who are watching us um, on stream, there is a comment in the chat from Corey uh, Anderson um, about a double flipped class uh, when if you have to teach face-to-face -face in this environment where we're not even six, but whatever it is the new for, for education, 14 feet apart or something, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but uh, some kind of even larger distance than six feet, um, the suggestion is maybe that then in class time is used for lecturing clarification and that maybe actually is done in English, but all the homework, um, uh, work can be interpersonal communication by connecting students in the way that Lynn showed us uh, when they do, when they connect online and they speak and they do um, these speaking activities outside the class. So that's, that's one model maybe that would work for those who are wondering about. Um, there was a comment that we're still told to teach face to face, but that face to face is going to be different. So Kristen, you had a hand up and then Shannon, I think you had a hand up. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to jump in um, because I, I will be leaving at three o'clock. And first of all, just, just enthusiastically endorse everything that Cindy just said um, about rethinking the way you are envisioning the course. Um, I, and, and I would say also to be kind to yourself um, and realize that you cannot change everything. I mean, I, again, I've been working on this for seven years and there is still so much for me to do and so much that I learn every semester. 
But um, my suggestion, and this is jumping ahead a little bit to the final question, um, in thinking about courses for the fall is if possible to take this opportunity to really embrace backward design. Um, that has been so helpful to me to sit down and think about, first of all, my course objectives, and then secondly, to look at each unit, think about what are my objectives for this unit, what are the materials I have at my disposal, and what are the activities that I want my students to do, and then take each of those elements and link them back to my overall objectives. And I do this very methodically on paper so that I can see where maybe I actually didn't have the right materials to meet an objective. And so does that objective move to a different part of the course or do I need more materials? Um, it's also helped me to eliminate some redundancy where I discovered I was just doing way too much on an objective that maybe didn't warrant it. And especially because so many of us are dealing with either fewer weeks in the semester or fewer contact hours, it has helped me to streamline the courses and, um, and, and to again, to make really, really certain that what I'm doing, whether it's in the group space or in the individual slash homework space, is, is furthering my goals and my students' goals. Um, so so that's, that's the thing that I wanted to say. Um, I would, will just respond, I, I totally agree. I, rethink, just free yourself and be nice to yourself. Those two, are, those two are really good pieces of advice. Be really, you know, rethink, give yourself the space to rethink uh, what you can do better in the online environment and then be gentle on yourself because you can't do it all. Um, there was a question here from Svetlana about the participation grade. So I will give credit for this idea to a participant that was in a workshop once who came up. Can I read it, Cindy? Hold on just a second. Can I read it? So um, the question is, um, we have to rethink participation uh, effort uh, rather than grade participation effort rather than attendance, whether in person or online. Our attendance and participation is usually 10%, and Svetlana is speaking for BU. According to my institution letter, we're not counting in person attendance as a part of the grading. Do you think we should get rid of this 10% okay. from the syllabus, or should it still say, but we implement attendance participation with new measures? And what could these new measures be? Okay. So why do we want participation? Because we assume that if you participate, you grow, that your language grows. So why aren't we grading growth instead of participation? So this was from a participant that I thought was just brilliant. And she said, we should call it a growth grade, not a participation grade. It doesn't, it's not about showing up and doing the minimum. If you show up and do the minimum, but you're not growing at all, why are you the student who's getting the A? If you show up and are doing the maximum and you still can't get the A because you're not meeting the, the expectation of some norm perfect uh, score of some sort, why shouldn't you be getting the A? If you're growing, your language is growing by leaps and bounds. So I would say rethink the idea of a quote unquote participation grade and say, if you are participating, you can't help but grow because of the way we'll design the activities. And I am looking to show, you, I am looking for you to show me your growth. And the online environment, like I said, where you're capturing all of the activities and the recordings, et cetera, it would be very easy to justify for them. Look, you've had, look at this enormous growth. Look at what you sounded like and looked like and, and, and wrote like in September. Look what it looks like now. So it's, it's documentable as well. It's not, it's not simply like, I feel like I've grown a lot and I do too as the teacher, so I'll give you a good grade. No, it's, it's documentable. I think Shannon was holding and then Lynn, you. Yeah. No, I, I lost my thoughts, so somebody else oh, can go ahead. <laughs> sorry, Lynn. <laughs> um, I, I think that for each of us, um, I've been looking at the chat and a lot of people are writing about face-to-face -face versus hybrid. And one of the things that I think is making all of our experiences so uncertain at a lot of campuses, it's not entirely clear yet what the format of teaching is going to be. And it's not entirely clear at a lot of campuses that the faculty member gets to choose it. Which, right, uh, because some people are writing, I'm being, I'm being pushed to teach face to face. And it's not clear to me that everyone is going to have a choice about how they offer their classes. So that's another complicating factor. And the answer to what is participation scoring or do we look at, how do we look at a student's um, engagement in the course? I like to think of it as their engagement and documenting that is really going to be very different for those of us who are, say, teaching online only 
versus those who have some kind of hybrid setup. I think it's essential though for everyone to think about having a rubric for this. I use a rubric that the students assess their own work every week. Um, and they fill out a form and there, is a, there are specific criteria and they get points for asking questions. They get points for indicating verbally that they've understood or not understood something. So, but that's, this of course is for synchronous classwork. And if you're doing asynchronous work, you may have a different way of assessing it. Um, and I also think another thing that will help with a synchronous online environment is making clear to students at the beginning of the course what good participation is in that environment. I mean, how many of us stare at a TV screen and look a little bit like this? It's very hard not to. Um, that's what we're used to doing when we're staring at a screen. And students really have to be um, encouraged both with, not necessarily with sticks, but certainly maybe with carrots to not fall into that habit. Um, and, and that can be done by modeling for them and also showing them with criteria that they get assessed on what good online participation is. And your orientation module of your course must include something about that. If it's going to be an online. Course. If you would be willing to share this kind of. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if the chat is set up to allow me to put the file there. It should. Okay, let me, I'll, yeah. I'll go looking for it. Let me, I'll put it, it'll, it'll go up in a bit. With a the, with the recording. Um, Kim also made a, a comment about this, that um, uh, this rubric could have, for example, like uh, offered the original ideas or something like this, like that there could be several uh, types of um, um, parameters that reward the kind of uh, uh, risk-taking behavior that, that Cindy suggested. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I, I also just want to say a word um, about uh, thinking about that participation rubric and uh, having some flexibility in there if you are teaching at an institution where uh, resources and access to the internet is not equitably distributed among your students. Um, that became really very obvious when we moved in spring term to, to the online format and uh, who, who actually had good internet, who was sharing that one Wi-Fi connection with three other people who were also doing face-to-face uh, -face meetings online at the same time. Um, and so thinking about that with some flexibility, uh, once again, as, as Cindy and other people have said, um, documentation of growth and engagement with material. Um, and maybe that's the way we frame it. And if it needs to be done a little offline or by phone, as opposed to in a Zoom chat, um, we really might wanna allow that to be an option for, for our students as well. Um, and I saw in the chat, um, what about handwriting? Mm -hmm. I was gonna I ask that question, thank you. I, I think handwriting is gonna take a big hit. Um, and I just think maybe we have to let that go. But you can have them uh, handwriting things and taking pictures on their phone and uploading for you. So I they can, can yeah. yeah, they can be submitting handwritten things as well. The big question is, you know, if, if going forward, um, are they only going to have to type things or are they actually going to have to write? It's hard for me still, maybe it's an age thing, to imagine a world in which you really don't know how to write. You only know how to type. Yeah. So I'm thinking in our curriculum, you're still going to have to know how to, to, to write. It's, it, you're not going to get away with just typing. So, But I think in an online environment, it, it, how much time will we spend on it is a big question. Well, one compromise might be that we are okay with students taking a little longer to get the handwriting system down because at the and because I'm thinking I'm going to have to teach them to type a little bit sooner. Normally typing is something I focus on in second semester. It might have to happen a little sooner and the proficiency in the handwriting, I may just have to space that out so it takes a little longer. Um, Shannon, you had a comment about that, and I, I, I know you have some tricks about teaching students how to type. Oh, yeah, um, I can send anybody. Um, there's a website, senselang.org, that where you can they can do typing lessons, and I usually do it in the middle of the first semester, mm -hmm. partly because we've been doing hybrid courses for a long time. 
And I barely use handwriting myself anymore. If you really think about how often you use it, I do think they still need to learn it. But typing, I think, is more important now. Um, and can I go back to one other topic, which is this idea of face to face versus hybrid versus online and this idea of flexibility. And I maybe um, selfishly want to tell you what my thoughts are and what I'm going to do and see what people think. But um, we are going to supposedly be face to face. However, we've already had students telling us that there are certain ones of them who are not going to be coming back to campus or may not feel comfortable. And so the thing that I think I'm planning to do um, is that our course is already hybrid and it is three hours a week face to face, at least traditionally. And then one, one hour a week online. That was already the, the model that we were using. What I'm thinking of doing now is having where each person has to come to two synchronous classes per week instead of three. They could either come to both online. Uh, no, actually one was asynchronous. Sorry, I'm already confused about my own plan. But um, either two uh, in person, Monday and Wednesday, or they could come to one in person and one on Zoom on Friday. Or if they wanted to do both online, they could do one on Zoom and one asynchronously. And then also kind of piggybacking on Lynn's idea about um, one hour or one kind of unit of work would be where they would have to meet uh, with another classmate or several classmates. So that is what I'm thinking of doing in order to give our students some flexibility. So they would, there would be two hours a week that they would be required to be in some kind of class, but some of the options would be in person and some would be online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there was a question, Shannon, when you get a chance to confirm that the link is correct. Uh, sense uh, hyphen lang. I'll work. put the link in the chat in just a moment. Um, in the, so we talked a little bit about what we gain, what we lose. Um, what about strategies that could support teaching large group of students more than 15? Because that was one of the questions that came earlier in the chat and, and I want to make sure that we get to it. A lot of this that we talk about, including providing even listening to two minutes of a recording when you have a class of 20 students and some of us are blessed with such large classes. Kind of related to that, um, that's part of the reason why I started having fewer synchronous hours in the spring because I had trouble with Zoom. And this may be the same thing that I'm facing in the fall to a certain extent. I think if I do have some large classes what I may be doing is dividing them into smaller classes, having them meet synchronously a little bit less, and then move some things to asynchronous. That's what I'm thinking of doing. I've thought about doing that too. Um, and there was a question, uh, does anybody have advice, I'm just jumping, on how to provide good, not time consuming, feedback on handwritten submissions? Lynn. Um, I actually found, because we use Canvas and I recognize that Canvas makes online um, typing into a PDF, it makes it really easy. Um, but what I sometimes do, particularly with students' essays, when I get handwritten ones, and you know how you tell them to skip lines when they handwrite an essay and they don't do that? Um, and then you're looking at trying to write their comments in margins. And what I sometimes do instead is I just make a comment sheet in a Word doc and I start writing the comments and I keep in the Word doc a, a comment that's go a set of comments that's going to everybody. So everybody gets that, no, you cannot say moya tiet zavut because 12 out of 13 people did. Um, but then I also keep comments for individual people and I put them all in one place and then sort them out into the people they need to go to in Canvas and just put them in the comments. Um, and I think homework grading, whatever makes it easiest for you to do the feedback and it's gonna depend on your uh, learning management system 
It's going to depend on a lot of things. I actually didn't find it onerous when students took pictures and uploaded them. For me in Canvas, it was fairly easy to, you know, I sometimes, I did various things. Sometimes I would highlight what they'd written. Sometimes I would just put a big underline and then put a comment on the side. If they're, if you're getting a lot of PDF saves or scanned things, I would say it's important for you if you don't, I can, I can hear a loud noise. Is that me? No. Um, if you don't have a way to sort things out, make sure you set up folders to keep track of what you're getting. Because other, if your learning management system will do it for you, great. Otherwise, make sure you set up folders so that you're not missing student stuff. Um, uh, and probably using the learning man management system, if you can, to collate and coordinate the assignments is a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, Canvas too, and it actually is very easy to do the feedback. But if you use the if you use an uh, iPad, you can use the iPad Pencil, and in yeah. Canvas you can actually do just what you would do on a piece of paper. You can write on the document in front of you, and it right. captures it for the student. So does it have to be a pro? An iPad, an iPad Air. I got an iPad Air for this purpose. Okay. Actually, a colleague at uh, Wisconsin Eau Claire turned me on to this, that you can actually just use the pencil and you can do the feedback, write handwritten feedback, just like you would do, not on your desktop or on your laptop, but if you're on your iPad, uh, and you're in Canvas anyway. I don't know what the other learning management systems would do, but that's also a real possibility. So, um, that's, that's what I was doing all this past semester. And it worked well, um, but I also have to say that uh, that um, advice to have everything well managed and organized by folders that's that's the key. The problem is, of course, we have students if they're joining us from China, they cannot use Google Drive. And that's what oh, that's enough, right. Right, and and I know I know the first answer to that is well they can go through VPN but not everybody in China has access to VPN and sometimes there are issues with that. So if, it's, if you have students from China who are actually in China joining remotely, Google Drive may not be the best, the best solution to, to have this folder. So for those students, it may have to be something else. Um, I know it, it, we have people typing uh, a lot of things in chat. There were a lot of questions that I've been reading. But if anybody, and I will continue doing that, if anybody wants to actually ask a question live or comment or something, um, please turn on your mic and, and uh, do that. Uh, and meanwhile, I'll scroll through the chat to see what we have not answered yet. Irina, mm -hmm. Irina, may I ask? Please, go ahead. Um, thank you, everyone. It was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> University of Central Florida, ALA. So I, I, I want to ask you, Shannon, is it possible for you to explain, because I am kind of confused right now, uh, our university is jumping from one part to another, so it's difficult <coughs> to understand what we are going to do in the fall. But... Um, how you are writing that that in the syllabus that it's going to be synchronous or it's going to be unsynchronous so how you explain them that yeah and i'm still working on that but um my plan is to have some kind of label you must go to class one every week and you must go to class two every week and here are the options for class one and here are the options for class two, okay. something like that, so that they know exactly what their choices are. Did that, did that answer your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. There was also a question about what do you think, while well, people are turning on their mics and thinking, what do you think about recording uh, each lesson and then having that? Um, we were required in the spring to record our class, any synchronous class that happened at Brown, we were required to record by the Dean of the college. Um, so I, I had to, um, my experience was that the, I asked the students how much they used it. Some, not at all. Um, I, I didn't get the sense. I think it probably helped out 
a couple there was there was a student in Taiwan who who you know she would do it because she couldn't come to class at one in the morning um, and but I didn't get the sense that necessarily helped a lot there may be times though when it is helpful um, if there's a particular part of a class that you want recorded because it either is you explaining something and you don't want to have to do that again or um, or if it is students doing some activity in groups and you want a, a student who's absent to be able to have some kind of not real interaction but at least access to what other people are saying so there may be times you want to record part of a class it does require that you think about all right am i turning on record here or not allah mm -hmm. yes allah uh-huh Mike. I am on, yeah, can you unmute? Thank you. Um, um, I have received the email today that if, uh, I don't know if somebody has experience, um, that uh, our classes are going to be face to face, but without students. <laughs> I kind of did not understand what it means. I'm not saying anything about the state of Florida. Yeah. <clears throat> so, did somebody have experience? That's a new one to me, I have to say. No idea. <laughs> so what does the, uh, so you, the faculty member, are required to be in a classroom. Without students. But the students are not. No. So it's the same as online. It's online. Oh. But no, it's in, in the syllabus. I mean, not in the syllabus, in the, um, how would I say, in my, um, like, schedule the university schedule it's face to face and i received the email just before our meeting um okay if you have face to face class so you're going to be in class but keep in mind that you're going to be without students and i was just like what wow nobody, nobody has experience okay perfect so in there was a question earlier from jane hacking and i and you know, that I can, you know, happy to, to outside of Zoom, somebody has some background. Thank you. Thank you for checking. So the question was, do, do, are there any suggestions for talking to the administration um, about choosing the mode, if there is a choice, choosing the mode of teaching? Um, so if we do have a choice of, uh, as instructors, what, what arguments can we suggest for not doing it face-to-face, -face? Uh, Bill? Um, I, I think particularly for, say, first semester or the beginning first year course, where you're really trying to teach pronunciation and sound, sound letter correspondence, um, the thought that I'm going to have a mask on and the students are going to have a mask on, this is absurd. Right? Um, they can't see the articulation in the mouth. Um, you can't have them practice. Um, I, yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the classes where I think you really do need to be remote um, because all of the visual cues that you would be giving are gonna be disturbed by those masks. Um, you're not gonna be able to hear them if they're all six feet away from you talking through a mask. Um, so I, I think that beginning level, in some ways, doing it technologically it is much better. Um, in a more advanced class, if your campus really wants you to be in person, I think I'd probably be more neutral. But once again, I think you're all going to have to be shouting at each other to be heard. And then you're not going to want to do any paired activities anyway, yeah. right? So, so why be six feet apart in the room? Yeah. Yeah. I agree um, that our book has tons and tons of pair and small group activities. And not only can they not sit close together to do them, I can't go up to them to give individual feedback. So there are things that I can't do that I would normally do. Uh, the students come to, when they, at Brown at least, they come to language classes wanting that interaction. They expect it. Um, the orientation to teaching of, nearly all my colleagues in all the languages I know of at Brown is pretty much communicative in the sense that a lot of the class time is about students making meaning, using language, understanding language, and interacting with each other as much as with the instructor. 
And if you take away the ability to have multiple students talking at the same time because they're working in a pair activity, then face-to-face -face instruction becomes almost unworkable. So all of the languages at Brown, with a couple of exceptions, put in uh, for um, when we were asked to say online, hybrid, or face-to-face, -face, nearly all the languages, and certainly intro and intermediate, all went for online. Um, but we were lucky to have the choice, and I recognize that not everybody does. Um, some, some commented in the chat, and I know that um, at Brandeis we were also told that if mask is a problem, um, and for some hard of hearing students, uh, mask would be a problem as well. So the solution is to have clear masks. But, right, but the argument, I think I, yeah, in addition to what Bill and Lynn, in addition to what you said, what, what, I, what I argued for all of our languages at Brandeis is, and not just languages, but I argued that in disciplines where learning at their core depends on constant and intense interact interaction between learners, not just between a student and an instructor, but actually between learners. They should be exempt from uh, this kind of, you know, that face-to-face that -face or hybrid mode where I have, by hybrid, because everybody uses this word differently, by hybrid, I mean high flex, where five students are online and 10 are in class at the same time. So that was my argument. But then again, I want to go back to Corey's comment in the chat um, about if, we, if we're forced to be face to face because that's what that's, that's the decision that, that is out of our control, it's not a choice, then we have to teach it completely differently. Then in class, we speak English, talking about the structures and uh, uh, making clarifications, and we're actually lecturing. And at home, they do that interactive work, sort of like what, what Lynn was showing us with, with those assignments. That's where they would be doing it then, if there is no choice. I don't know what, what um, other people on the panel may think about this. Um, I, I, I suppose that in a situation where you're being forced to do face-to-face um, -face meetings, meaning that you're forced to get a whole group of people into the same room, um, when you wanted to do smaller activities, then maybe it does, and Lee Roby has a kind of comment on here that made me think about this, then maybe there are moments when everybody takes out their laptops, puts in their earphones, right? and from six feet away, they do over Zoom a recorded version of their interpersonal activity or uh, information gap activity. Yeah. Um, it does seem rather silly to get them all into the same room to do that, but um, anyway, right. that silliness may go well with some administrators. I also had the idea that because I'm extremely likely to have online students as well as face-to-face -face students if there's a face-to-face -face day or whatever um, I would try to see if, if the enrollments work I would try to then have that in-class synchronous thing be the online student who's dialed into the course and the in-class student work as a pair and then there's a motivation for for you know, student face to face and student online to talk to each other, um, but I it's it's I and I'm on sabbatical in the fall too. I have a TA teaching this class. I have to be very protective of her. I can't just toss a grad student into a world where she's essentially teaching two classes. Right. That's just that would be um, Lynn, unthinkable. Lynn, can you share with? Uh me or maybe everyone needs that your orientation mod module what you are writing not done yet what i am going to it's it's being worked on um uh i am going to probably take the canvas um whatever gets designed the the canvas mm -hmm. course and i'm going to port it out to the canvas commons so it'll be a brown canvas course but it will go out to i'll, I'll share it publicly thank you thank you 
Um, anybody else who wants to ask a question live rather than typing, because we may be, uh, there is a lot of movement in the chat, so sometimes it's hard to keep track. So if we're missing, if I'm missing somebody's question that we haven't really addressed yet, please um, uh, ask it live. Um, can Lee Robbie comment on secondary school teaching in the current climate? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think there's such great variety in pre-college that it's kind of hard to categorize. But um, where you are, for instance. Well, so I'm at Friends School of Baltimore, so I would say that my situation is very, very similar to your situation. My classes are under 18 students. Um, we, uh, we don't know what we're going to do yet. We're advocating for um, as much virtual as possible. You know, I'm at a private school, so there's huge, I think mostly coming from parents um, and the financial viability of institutions um, to bring students onto campus. Um, I think for our school, we're prioritizing our elementary school students and trying to get them to school every day. We have to maintain obviously the same social distancing. And so I do think that will free the upper school up to not be on campus every day because there's limited space. So we're looking at a variety of models. We may be four. What I'm hoping is that we're four days of virtual um, learning, um, kind of like in the spring. We also had the advantage of going another month longer. So I think we got better control over, you know, we had more practice. Whether we got better control or not, I don't know. Um, and then coming onto campus for a community day on Wednesdays, it would be non-academic, but we may be on campus having them in a classroom. Um, whatever we do, we're only gonna see them for 60 minutes twice a week. So I think that's gonna be our biggest. And, and also remember that we will have, you know, this is because kind of, you know, we are covering all of this, but we will have a separate conversation uh, about a lot of this specifically for, uh, for schools. I, I wanted to go back, um, wanted to go back to the question about what to do when students are in the high flux, when we're teaching in the high flux model, where some students may be in the class and some online, because there were some questions about this, like, can we do Zoom while teaching in class? Yeah, that's precisely what we will have to do, I guess, but that is also precisely why it's going to be difficult. So the way, the way I see it is that the, there are two possibilities. Number one, we demand that uh, demand <laughs> that um, there is there is a digital um, assistant in the class if that is how we are because I cannot ensure my presence both in person and online at the same time. Um, that's one possibility as I see it or uh, we break up the group into smaller groups and each group gets less of my time uh, but maybe it's a more intensive time and both groups, or, or I meet with one group on one day in person and with a different group online on a different day. Um, so I, I'm, I would not do the high flex at all. I, I, would, I would avoid that situation. Yeah. yeah, to me that sounds like, I, I, my reaction when I heard about it, Brown's intention was originally to try to, they said, we're going to make all the classes accessible online, even if they're taught face to face, which is essentially guaranteeing something like a high flex model if you're doing any kind of face to face teaching um, or, or encouraging that. And, you know, this, this is the moment when all the language teachers said, no, we want to offer our courses online. Um, but uh, we are also in a state that has mask procedures in place. We are not, uh, we're not <coughs> pushing, we're, we're de-densifying the campus and the first years aren't even coming until second semester. So we won't have any freshmen in the fall. Do want, right, you know, there are all kinds of, it raises more questions than it answers, but it does answer some for me about getting to choose how the courses will be organized. So I think we maybe have a time for one more question, if there is any other question or comment. Um, can I ask? Please. Can I, can I, yeah. I don't know if you've ever opened any um, channels for students to 
speak with each other in Russian and for us probably to monitor it somehow. Do you do this? Like, I don't know whether it is... Yeah, do you make it part of the class, brother? Part, the, the place where they can, can communicate in Russian with each other and post, I don't know, pictures, uh, do something, discuss something that's interesting for them. And do you oversee it as a teacher or not? Well, well, you can, if you're using Zoom, you can put them in breakout rooms and you can go in and out of the breakout rooms. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not, not during the class, not during the class, not during the class, not during the class. No, well, I, that's what the example I showed was, it was part that. of the class. Mm -hmm. It was conducted asynchronously outside of class time and they had to do speaking activities. We also have an undergrad assistant who runs Russian language table and she just can, she moved Russian language table to a Zoom conversation weekly. And that continued to get students coming in um, that wasn't assessed at all. The asynchronous Tuesday activities, those were assessed as part of the engagement um, in the class. Um, I was gonna ask something that just lost. I, as soon as I opened my mouth, I lost my thought. Um, I, I should Lee, Lee, in, while I'm searching. Oh, sorry, uh, Bill and then Lee. Uh -huh. um, I, I could toss in another idea. If you want to encourage students to have a space in which they interact with each other outside of class, right, then maybe setting up some kind of Google Doc where you invite all them to it. Um, you'll have to make it clear whether you're going to peek in or just let them go at it. Um, uh, but that would be some one way of, of creating some kind of community feel, or if there's some kind of online discussion board in your learning management system that you wanna turn on, let them go at it. Um, once again, make it clear whether you're going to pop in to view this or not, um, and then follow through with that. Um, that might help them be able to also then use things like Google Hangouts if they want to have a virtual study session together um, and encourage some more community building. The I, I remember what I wanted to ask. What about social media, like a closed account on Instagram or yeah. Facebook? Just for the yeah. sorry, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to ask because, the, the, yeah, of course, sometimes students they organize themselves, they make a page for themselves on Facebook. But do you is it do you think it's useful to monitor this to pop in to, to uh, correct something or not or just leave it, leave them oh, to a couple of things with, uh, about the mechanism and then about whether or not the feedback is, is useful. The mechanism you can, if you have Elms or Canvas or your learning management system allows it, you can organize groups, you can organize pair two people as a group, and you could organize a Zoom meeting right there, which means when they log in to do the assignment at a certain time, they will be able to access each other in that Zoom meeting. Uh, I think it's important, obviously, as William just said, to decide whether you're going to pop in or not. Um, with all feedback, I think you first have to think about what's the point of the feedback and is it going to help them? So I think there are times when you want them to just be sort of trying to con spontaneously communicate without somebody, without that, that glancing at the teacher thinking, oh, did I just say that right? Oh, did I just do that wrong? Oh, I just, I don't know that word. So I think sometimes you don't want to be in, in there. Um, and other times the, it's the targeted feedback that makes a difference, right? So you just have to think about, I think they need space for both. Um, and, they, and they have to know right now, the point is I'm giving you the feedback. So when I interrupt you, when I recast, you have to recast after me. Recast is useless if you don't make them repeat it again. Um, but, the, uh, but then they have to have space where they can, where they can interact. One of the things that um, I have kind of toyed with because two first semester Russian students are not gonna go very far if you turn them into free conversation, right? But if you can pair them with an upper level student, uh, if, if you have that kind of ability in your program to work with other faculty, to have engagement with another Russian student, to have international students, yeah. being able to engage and there, you know, we have programs for that where the actual engagement is meaningful it's purposeful let's get to know one, one another let's talk about our free time activities give them a topic give them a purpose for the interaction not just it's our turn to log on and do what for the next 20 minutes uh talk i guess 
in Russian. We're supposed to speak. I don't know what about. I don't know, right? So just organizing those those sessions as well. We're out of time, unfortunately, and I know I didn't get to Lee who had a comment and some more questions came in just as uh, as we were making, um, as, as Cindy, you were speaking and Katya, you asked the question. So uh, we will save the chat. We will share everything that was shared. I just want, before, before we end, I want to do two things. First of all, to highlight, if you missed it in chat, Shannon announced a webinar that she will be doing um, later, not through UC, uh, ACTR. Um, um, so Shannon will we'll include that in, in the email that will go out. Um, and I wanted to give a chance to Colleen uh, Lucy to um, speak a little bit about next week's conversation. Um, just if you want to say a couple of words, what it is going to be about. Sure. Thank you, Irina, and thank you to the panelists for a very vibrant and engaging conversation that was extremely helpful to think about as we gear up for the fall semester. And next week's conversation will likewise deal with some tricky and troubling issues, especially given um, COVID-19's um, kind of raging through the Southwest where I'm located in Arizona, but throughout the nation. Um, next week's conversation will be devoted, devoted to inclusivity in the Russian language classroom. And while we're gonna focus on language instruction, our panelists will also bring in practices and insights from the culture classroom and outreach initiatives for students of color. The, uh, we have four wonderful panelists who have agreed to take part. Um, Thomas Jesus Garza, ACTR past president and current board member, who is also a member of the AC's Committee for the Advocacy of Diversity and Inclusion, and who is a longtime advocate uh, for equity in our discipline, will be taking part. Lindsay Ceballos, who is from Lafayette College, who has expertise in anti-racist teaching practices. Lauren Nelson, who is an instructor at Pritzker College Prep in Chicago, where she teaches Russian language uh, to 11th and 12th graders. So we'll have the, that uh, perspective as well. And finally, Rachel Stoffer, who teaches courses in Russian and Spanish at James Madison University and Russian courses in the Russian flagship program at Virginia Tech. And she's also, you might know her uh, from her work at Atseal where she's the conference manager. She's published on, published on issues of race and uh, representation language materials uh, among other things. And we welcome all of the ACTR um, panelists who are here today and all of the, the participants in the conversation to take part. Um, it's a vitally important issue for the future of our profession and our panelists will talk about some broader issues related to inclusivity and diversity before moving to practical suggestions um, with some specific teaching practices to make for the classroom, whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or fully online, or a mixture of both as we gear for fall 2020. Thanks, Serena. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. A round of applause <laughs> in some kind of virtual or real form. Um, thank you to all the participants, to members and non-members of ACTR. We're, you know, it's, it became kind of a cliche now to say we're all in it together, but um, we really are. So uh, hopefully our collective minds, my collective mind <laughs> will, will help us face uh, what's coming in the fall. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. Thank you, Irina. We'll see you next Friday. <laughs>